Rev it up and welcome to Cars Yeah, show number 1,192. Keep your eyes on the stars and your feet on the ground. This is Cars Yeah, where you'll enjoy interviews with inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Mark Green is here to provide you with a fuel injection of automotive inspiration. So get in, sit down, buckle up, and get ready for a wild ride here on Cars Yeah. Hello, automotive enthusiasts. I am revved up and so excited to introduce today's very special guest calling in from Irvine, California, Pontus Fonteus. Pontus, are you buckled up and ready for a fun ride? I'm ready, Mark. Thank you for your kind interest in me and GAC as a company. Absolutely. Pontus Fonteus is the Executive Design Director of GAC Advanced Design Center in Los Angeles, California. GAC is one of the China's largest automakers producing FCA vehicles, Toyotas, Hondas, Mitsubishis, and Peugeots under license for the Chinese market. He is an internationally recognized Swedish car designer who graduated from the Art Center College of Design in Switzerland back in 1993. Pontus has lived and worked in eight countries before his current role at GAC. He has nearly 30 years of design experience within the areas of automotive transportation, product and graphic design, advertising, illustration, architecture projects, and with the VW Design Studio in Berlin. He served as the interior chief for Ferrari and worked at Volvo Car Corporation, Kia Motors Europe, General Motors, Renault, and Volkswagen. You have been all over the place, Pontus. He is spearheading the launch of a GAC vehicle for the American market in 2019. We're going to learn a lot more about that. So I've told our listeners a little bit about you, Pontus. Please take a moment, share a little bit more about your career and your passion for automobiles before I jump into the questions. All right. Thank you so much, Mark. So it started very, very early. I actually wanted to be an architect. My mother is a fashion designer and my father worked together with her doing the commercial part of that. And I think that perhaps if my parents wouldn't be fashion in fashion industry, Maybe I would have gone there, but I don't know. So architecture what was, was driving me until I got the opportunity to do the summer work with a friends to my parents for two summers. And it was not what I expected. It was too much draft tables and everything was black and gray and with rulers and whatever. And, you know, architecture at that time and, you know, without the Internet, it was hard to get like, you know, connected to all the groundbreaking architecture in the world that has been for for long before. But anyway, I had a passion for cars as well. And uh, very early, you know, you start to dream about cars, play with cars. That's what you do when you're a boy. And you're really longing for the day when you can have your own driving license. So I read every magazine. I knew everything about cars. And I was very much into it. But it took some time because I started as a freelance illustrator. And then I was working as a technical illustrator. uh, And then I did my mandatory army service as a military police in Stockholm, in Sweden. And then I started with advertising. And when recession hit in the end of the 80s, I started up my own company for a year and it went so-so. And a friend came to me and said, Pontus, have you seen this? This is really good design school. And this guy just won a competition, like a reader competition. And Mm -hmm. I yeah, I can do that better. But I wanted so much to be autodidact as it was, because my heroes were the Italian designers. And none of them have actually done any design education. They were extremely talented. So I kind of understood I need some education. So I went down with my portfolio and that was everything. It was not only cars, it was art, it was graphic design, it was architecture, it was products, it was lady shoes, it was you name it, you know. Because when you're young, you have so much drive. You have absolutely no experience, but you have confidence. And that is what drives you because otherwise you don't have so much. So luckily, they admitted me to the school. And I started already there without any former design education uh, in advanced standing in fifth term in Art Center, which means that I only had four semesters of taking uh, student loans and uh, living on water and bread. So <laughs> yeah. At that time, it was uh, Uwe Bunsen, who was the former design chief for Ford Europe. And it was a very special time for me 
art center, which was in, in Vevey, Montreux, in Switzerland, was placed in a, a little ch- a chateau. So it was uh, very, very chic, so to say. A small yes. school, very familiar. And all the teachers and Uwe Bunsen was very much like mentors. And you got to know the industry and you get the exposure. And, and they actually led you to the right company and the, and the right career. And then I was sponsored uh, from Art Center two semesters. So I worked in the library, uh, rearranging their, their design books and everything. And then I had the great privilege to have sketch classes for younger students. Then it went to my first job. So it started with a genuine interest, of course, but the longer I worked, the more I understood that I'm truly a designer, a designer of everything. So cars are, for me, maybe the the state of the art product is the way that I think that I can express myself. It's dynamic. It's 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 a sculptural object. It's it's truly innovative when it comes to technology. It's engineering. It's all kind of the different arts and crafts in one object, so to say. And I think it's highly interesting. And it is culturally important for us human beings. It's important in any city landscape or on the street. So it's a little bit like, I would say, more modern horse. We have some kind of connection to this product. Very cool. I love it. A wonderful background. Well, let's continue on your journey and talk about a mantra or some kind of success quote that you have. Maybe something you live by. It's a nice way to get the inspirational tires turning here or the pencil flowing Mm -hmm. here at Pars. Yeah, so Pontus, take the wheel. So, yeah, thank you, Mark. I think that uh, at least I changed a lot through my my life. and, And, you know, I had the privilege to work and live in so many different countries. And, um, meet so many talented people that I learned a lot from. But I think as, as, a, as a young guy, uh, you had like a big ego because you think I'm going to conquer the world and I'm going to be the most famous. And, you know, because, but you have to have it to survive. It's a little bit like, you know, when, when you start to working in an industry and, and with a certain kind of, you know, object, you think it's fairly easy and, 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 and kind of linear. But the more you are involved in it and the more you learn and the more people you you're you're interacting with you understand how complex it really is and it's like you look at the stars yeah it's like black sky and some some points of light that kind of flashes and whatever the more you learn you just go it's mind-boggling how complex the universe is it's you know let's not pretend that any one of us truly understands it but that is also the mantra that i learned later it's like, um, and I think it was Theodore Roosevelt who said it, like, keep your eyes on the stars and your feet on the ground. I like my head up in the stratosphere. I truly aim for, for the stars. And I know maybe we reach the treetops, but just this kind of vision that always trying to conquer and do the best. But do not forget that there is like a team of people around you and you, you really have to to treat people around you as you want to be treated yourself to actually achieve that. And I think that some people will never learn that, uh, which <laughs> yes. is sad. But I think that if, if, you, if you have uh, an ounce of success in your life, I think that uh, a little bit of a head clear kind of check control is that you get more humble. Yes, absolutely. I've had a lot of designers on the show here. And a lot of them have said things very, very similar. And you, you struck on a key thing, their team, because designing cars these days is not an isolated project. There's a massive number of people, bureaucracies, rules, regulations. There's so much complexity to it. But uh, I love that. Keep your feet on the ground, but shoot for the stars. Very exactly. nicely said. Exactly. Well, let's go back in time and talk about a story that instigated your personal passion for cars. Is there a pivotal moment in your life when you knew that you just very well may be a car designer, a car guy? Yeah, I, I think that, you know, since I dreamt about cars and, and, you know, I loved cars and knew everything about car and I felt that I was a designer, I was a creative person, it was pretty easy that I actually took that as my trajectory of, of business and, and career. But what happened a couple of times, and we will probably come back to that, is the time where I thought cars are not, is not for me. Like I want to do something else because, as I said, I am more into the possibility of creating this product. You know, like we put 
people in this moving vessel and we just try to make the life better uh, on board. And it's actually a very human centric product. And I think that the times where I've been fed up with the business because it's been too conservative and too much money oriented or too much marketing and too much hindering us from actually doing something which is better for, for mankind. Because let's face it, like, I mean, I'm not finding a, a cure for 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 cancer or doing anything which is really good, but I would like to make what I can do in what I'm I'm good at much better and more beautiful for the people, and that that would be my heritage and, and the the people. And I try to touch people with thinking of the product that we create as much as possible, so they feel that they are appreciated when they're dealing with the product. That's the best kind of remote kind of you know interaction I can have. Sure. Um, with with the clients of our product, so I think that a couple of times I just thought, no, this the, I, I would do something else. This is not creative too much, and a big OM is too constrained, and they don't understand. And and luckily, um, I, I got a great opportunity to come back in the car business, and it it just made me much better as a as a designer, as a person, as as understanding everything more holistically. I know what you mean, having grown up with a father who's an architect and focusing on design so much. To this day, and my wife chuckles at me when I see something and I pick it up and I go, why didn't they try a little harder? This is so terrible. (laughs) It doesn't feel good in your hand. I mean, even a fork. There's certain forks that we have in the house that I will only eat with because the other ones are just too stupid. I just, I can't stand them. So I don't know, maybe it's a curse my father left behind or maybe it's a A good thing. I like to think it's a good thing that I'm always striving for something that's a little bit better and appreciate that. So it's nice to hear that. I understand it from a design standpoint. Well, let's take a look at some of the many roads you've driven down and talk about a big challenge or a big failure. You've worked for a tremendous number of different companies, some known as very beautiful cars like the Ferraris or the basic cars like Kias. Is there a a challenge that you've come up against? I'm sure you've had a few. That uh, you just went, man, this is a really tough one. And kind of walk us through how the lessons learned from that help you move forward versus walking away. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, wow. It's That is a tough question. I don't know if I can really, really answer that straight. But the thing is that when you're designing something, the, the robots or, or the machines or, or whatever is going to manufacture what you do, doesn't really have any aesthetical understanding or eyes to judge it with. So it doesn't really matter from, well, you can do it kind of cheaper and and you can slipstream manufacture and whatever. But the thing is, what I'm trying to say is that the challenge is, is of course, to do an end product, which as good as possible for the end consumer and also satisfying what you want to achieve, what you think is, is the best for them. But it's as, as much as a challenge or even more so to do an inexpensive people that are done in many, many thousands more of, of, of units than to do like a, a low production volume for that is you know only for, for a few rich people. Because... I think, and, and you know, you mentioned that your father was an architect. I'm pretty sure that he and, and many, many architects will rather do like a, a, a small house with a very limited budget than to do like a grand 14 bathroom mansion with no budget at all. And when you are restrained, you are forced to come to compromises. The compromises will make you make better decision, so to say. So I, I usually say it's like every successful uh, electric circuit has some resistance in it because that's how you yeah. make, get the most out of it. And therefore, like it doesn't really matter for me if it's a small uh, Renault city car or if it's, uh, it's a very expensive uh, mid-engine uh, supercar because it's just that drive to create. That is something that I, I I've been looking for in my life this curiosity for learning more. So I think that if I would not be a car designer, I would probably be a crime investigator. You know, you have to solve a riddle. There's something that itches and you have to 
feel your intuition and, and you just have to get it done. You have to get like something, you have to solve the mystery. And a lot of the car design and what we do, um, you know, complex products is just solve this mystery in the best way you can. Uh, and, sure. you know, we we have to be creative and we have to uh, invent something. And that's what is the silver lining for me, that it's new and no one sees this before and it's innovation and, and whatever. You know, you, we're doing a Skype here so we can see each other and you probably see a big smile on my face right now because you brought something up that my father encountered. He did a lot of custom home designs, but he spent three years in Saudi Arabia designing virtual mansions for the Saudi royal family, their vacation homes on the ocean. Unlimited budgets. And after his first year, he came back for a, a break. Actually, I, I went over and we met in Italy and we spent a month in Italy traveling around, which was fantastic. I was in college. And I said, Dad, it must be incredible to have unlimited budgets because you've designed all these homes for people back home who had very limited budgets or they, they had some kind of budget. And he said, you know, I thought it would be spectacular and it's not. I much prefer having limitations that you have to work around because when you have an unlimited budget, yes, you can do anything and everything, but it also creates a whole nother dynamic that really isn't much fun. Mm. And he said is extremely wasteful. And that just bothered him. So what you just shared with me brought back that wonderful memory in Italy with my dad and talking about that. And at the time I was a college kid, I thought unlimited money, that would be the best thing on the earth. But, uh, I understand now, and as you share that with me, why that is a constraint from a design standpoint. Now, how about a career aha moment? You've moved through a lot of different things. You've done a lot of different design things in your career. Is there one big aha moment, a big pivot that you took that uh, really took you down a new path that maybe surprised you a little bit? Yeah, um, I have a couple. I have a couple, I think. So when I was at GM, and that was my first job, they were very talented people there, clay uh, sculptors and designers, and the team ambience was really good. Germany, maybe not for me. I love to work in, in Germany, but I'm like, I'm like a, a, an ocean boy. Like I like the beach and the water and, and, and this kind of coast alive too much. So I didn't really get that. And, and every time I have not lived by the water, I'm getting a little bit unhappy. So, you know, some people like the mountains, you know, or like landscapes, you know, I, I love the ocean. So I was also a little bit, as I said, um, underwhelmed by that we didn't do any cars that any of us wanted to drive. And, you know, we didn't have any cool niche cars and, and uh, it was, it was boring. So I thought, because I always done figure drawing, maybe that is, is the heritage I have from, from my mother and the fashion illustration and whatever. So I always did, did people um, uh, next to the car. And also maybe it's because it's human centric and I want to tell a story because it's not a dead object. It's something that we interact with. So the human aspect is very important. It's a little bit of a bitch though to do human drawings next to a car because you're striving for different proportions. The humans you try to work in the set and the cars is in, in X or Y. So one is very also horizontal, the other one is very vertical. So it's really hard to get the best proportions of, of each each object, so to say. So I, I did some some figure drawings and I had some illustrations out in magazine. I had a calendar and whatever. And I thought, I'm just going to stop doing car design and I'm going to go back and do this. And Renault offered me a very good position. And this was uh, when Renault and they still are, I think, the haute couture making of the cars with the concept cars and and it was a wonderful time in in paris but i thought i will go to paris renault will sponsor my movement they pay my rent i do my day job as car but then as soon as i can i start to work with with my heroes which was at that time terry mugler and and Gaultier and and all of that so that was my plan and then i came into the renault studio and at gm studio everything we did was like working straight in the clay of course there was like sketching but it was more to just on like paper to do the theme to actually come to design when i came to renault i i saw there were so fantastic artists there and so great designers and they always tried to think a little bit of head so um, a lot of times they say premier degree which is my oh it's just the first thought it's just too basic 
what's happening around the corner and what's happening next to that. Plus, they were very inspired by architecture and product design and fashion and graphics, something that we as an automotive company were not so influenced by. So I thought, shit, here I come. They have actually paid me a high salary and I'm not the hottest guy here, but I want to be and I think I can be. And at least I want to take up that challenge. And that's when I and I stayed five years there until I got another really great uh, offer from the Audi Volkswagen studio in Sitges, which was this super vitrina case, advanced studio working with all the brands, Bugatti, Bentley, Skoda, Volkswagen, Audi, Seat, whatever, just south of Barcelona at the beach, which was a fantastic company and fantastic opportunity, extremely talented people and an amazing work ambience. But that was the first time where I really saw that there is another layer of car design, which actually is very appealing to me. And I want to know it. I want to make it. And then I got really hungry because a few years at GM, I was a little bit comfortable. It was more like a job. But then again, it was my life. And I think that's very important. I need my professional life to be my life and not a work. So hobby and work is the same for me. And I think that's not a curse. That's a blessing because I never count hours. So, you know, you eat when you're hungry and we go home when you're tired. Otherwise, it will be almost like a prison. So I'm very, very grateful for, for this. So that was the first one where I got the real high experience. The second time was when I actually stopped working uh, in the industry 2010 and I stepped down as a director for Volvo. And, you know, I was maybe on the peak of my career doing all the interior and the strategic work for Volvo, not only in the, in the headquarters in Gothenburg, but also for the studio in Barcelona and our American advanced studio. I was really tired of it. You know, my life was owned by my PA who dictated my schedule. You have to sneak away and doing design in the lunch breaks. Everything was meetings and decisions. It was very little creative. And I was not happy. You know, it was, yeah, executive maybe. But, you know, I don't give a toss about miles on, on my airplane account and these things. I'm here because I love to work. So I said, I, I trained to enough. I will start my own brand. So if you've done the science, what is bigger than that? It's a brand. What is bigger than that is to affect people's lifestyle. So I started, now I will do what I should have done when I was young. Then I started doing that and, and was very, very enthusiastic. And then Ferrari called and asked me if I could come down. And then I actually not only did interiors, but I did all the merchandise and the Ferrari store, and I got all the kind of parameters what I thought was was great. And it's an amazing brand um, with the heritage and, and whatever. But actually, after 10 years, and I was flying forth and back because my family was then in Sweden, that was not the lifestyle. I mean, Maranello is amazing, but it's inland Italy. I mean, it's far from the coast and, and whatever. So I started to contract, and then I contract for many companies. And they were not interested in me as a manager or a chief. They were actually interested in me as a creative person. So I did the Land Rover Discovery as an interior designer at the tender age of 47. Most of designers, and this is what bugs me off when it comes to car designers, in all other creative professions, architects, art directors, creative director at the ballet or theater or film, people are really creative, long, long time. And, you know, an artist is a young artist when he or she is 50. So why do we have to stop being creative as car designer? And what is it that our lives turns more into, and I don't say this as a bad thing, but executive gray suit, tie, doing executive decisions and not being hands-on because I'm not getting happy with that. I mean, I'm getting more frustrated because I still have so much to, to share, I think, and I, I need to be inspired by the people. So that is when I thought this is really happening. I'm creative, I'm old, and I have all the expertise. I can see it as a side of my executive design director, and I can see it as an, you know, from the perspective of an intern 
or junior designer. So my empathy for all the people both above me or under me was really in balance. And I also figured out that a lot of times I'm actually, and I wouldn't say better, but I maybe have more diverse experience than the person that I report to. So by boosting your own ego, is that going to make it smooth? No, because then I could also be not very talented because I'm going to be hard to work with. So I thought I'm just going to be the more slipstream and the easiest tool, you know, the, the very easy tool in the toolbox, super smooth. And then I understood also like that is the only way you can survive and you can come to the best end products in a creative team. Super flat hierarchy and nothing about experience, just a goal and what you set up to do. And that was the biggest moment for me. Um, maybe it should have come earlier in the career. Or as I said, some people never figure it out. But, you know, we are core designers. We are whatever says on our business cards. It's not so impressive. But what we do on a daily basis and how we interact with people and how we help to boost people's creativity and the end product. That is what is important. Very interesting. Love it. That is cool. Wonderful story. Well, let's talk about cars that you've owned and driven. Is there a first car in your life that you acquired that was a driver for you that was really special? Yeah, since this is Skype and, and the listeners doesn't have visuals, they don't see that you have a really nice uh, sweater saying Alfa Romeo. Oh, yeah. That, <laughs> I was wearing my Alfa sweatshirt today. Yeah. Yep. So that was <laughs> my, my first three cars was all Alfa Romeo. The first one was an Alfa Sud Sprint Veloce, flat boxer engine. I think it was an Austrian engineer, very good package, Gijaro design. And then I followed that up with the GTV 2.0 and the GTV 6, which was as close as you could come to the drama of owning a Ferrari or a supercar at that time. And those cars was amazing because they had soul. They had the content and they, they had personality. I actually haven't owned a lot of cars. Um, because, you know, you run with company cars and then I move country so many times. So um, you don't really have classic cars, or at least I have. Maybe I have the opportunity now when, when I'm in beautiful California. That's what I like so much here is the, is the great respect and the car culture of all kinds, from hot rods to low riders to supercars. It's like a fantastic fauna or cross-section of, of various cars here. I had a, a Porsche 928, uh, which was amazing. I'm a, I'm a Land Rover guy now since I, um, since I live here and I worked um, at Land Rover. I, I truly, re really like that brand. It has great proportions um, because it comes because it's a very worthy off-road vehicle. So short overhangs. I noticed that in California with a lot of the bad roads here, it's very good to have a 4x4. Four so, um, yeah. so get you the potholes <laughs> yes so, so i really uh, i'm a sucker for the for for those kind of uh more utilitary vehicles now nice yeah. nice do you have a seller's remorse story is there one of these cars you've owned that you wish you kept you still had yeah the nine to eight because oh. um we went on our honeymoon on that me and my wife it was a porsche 928 s gold and with brown interior I usually described it as champagne exterior and tobacco or tobacco interior. It sounded better. Yes. It was a very <laughs> kind of 70s uh, color. It had a name. It was called Rheingold after the, the, the gold that was, you know, illegible, like after the World War, War II in uh, dumped yeah. by the Germans in, in, in the Rhine, whatever. Yeah. I, I thought that was um, a very pure design and, uh, and it was also very different than what was currently on the road. And I think that is the risk you have to take as a designer uh, and you have to convince um, the, the brand or the, the, the rest of the people that are making the decisions that by being a trendsetter and be in advance, you have to take maybe a little bit of the risky road, but you have to do it in a good way. So is it going to be a flop or a flip? That is the thing. Yes, absolutely. 928s. Yes. Remember when they came out, I got to be part of the Porsche driving experience and the uh, instructor that they saddled me up with was 
None the less than Vic Elford, very famous Porsche race car driver. He's been a guest on the show many years later, of course. Uh, couldn't believe that I got Vic to be my my co-driver as we drove all the new Porsche models. But he told me that day, he said, what do you think of the new 928? This is when they just came out. I said, oh, I don't like it at all. The engine's in the front, it's water-cooled. I like my 911s. And he said, Mark, at the end of the day, you're going to like the 928. And he was right. It was a very, very nice car to drive. Well, I'd love for you to share with our listeners, GAC, what the company's all about, the things you can share about what's coming in the future. I know there's a lot of secrecy of what car de- companies are developing, but just kind of give our listeners a little better understanding about the company, the brand, and what you're doing here in Southern California uh, with a company from China. Thank you for the question. No, you're right. I mean, um, I was asked some time, a uh, long time ago, to write a little episode in a motor magazine about my life as a, as a car designer. And it started with, I have to kill you if I tell you. And, <laughs> yeah. and, and yeah. you know, this business is a little bit like we would work for FBI or CIA or, or some secret service. So I can't really indulge too much what we're doing, but I'm, I'm very, very privileged to, to, to get the responsibility and share working here for GIC, um, which is, which is very historical. So, is the first time that, and, and we are government, we are owned by the region of Guangzhou, and we share this advanced design center, Los Angeles, with an R&D center up in Silicon Valley in San Jose, and we are going to open our R&D center in Detroit in the beginning of January. So GIC is very, very serious about entering the North American market and you know, expand as a global company. And, you know, it's a little bit sensitive right now, uh, as we see. So we don't really want to to speak about that too much. Actually, we should not take the sensitive thing at all. We should just forget about this. I will stop after the the um, Detroit Center. Okay. Yeah. We'll just we'll just end it at no, that and then just, it's just open up so many things of of the sensitivity and Trump and China and you know it's sure. like a big kind of of yeah. but I, I can just wrap it up a little bit. So okay. what what is extremely, extremely interesting for us and, and, and this is where I came from and when I uh, decided that America and, and uh, you know, especially California was where I wanted to to live for and, and to bring my family um, to hopefully this is our final destination. I got a great opportunity to to be part in the very beginning of a startup company for the future FF. And we worked very, very hard. I, I think I did 90, 95 hours with a team for the first one, two years because we had to do a, a product in a very short time frame and and is a very very extra, uh, you know exciting challenge and and what the brand was was so what we st- struggled with is like most of the startup companies it's the logistics i mean i have a pretty good knowledge about how to design a car and you know all the technical aspects and put it in production but i can't do the money so I can't be responsible for the money and the financing of the, of the car and the product, and I can't manufacture it. So it's much, much more other people have to do that. And this is what I lacked. This is the, 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 the backup and, and the artillery that you need when you do a car. And with GIC, when that opening presented itself, I thought, here is something that I can assist them with, you know, knowledge, experience, building up a team, doing car inside out, build up a UI, UX team, interior, exterior, and really be part of their growth because they have fantastic products already. I can benchmark my design in factories that I can compare with already what they do. So yeah. for me, that is a game changer to have a new company, which are have they're very, very ambitious. and they want to grow and they want to be successful. So it's a little bit like a startup, but they're already doing about 2 million units a year. So they know how to do it. Uh, GIC is a, is a very humble company. They are human-centric. On paper, maybe it doesn't look that it would be a perfect match between me, maybe a little bit of extrovert Swede that's been around the world and work with luxury brands, and a Chinese company. But I am Swedish, and as I mentioned before, also how I found the best 
the best way how to get uh, superior products is this flat hierarchy and working with a human. So we noticed that their philosophy and they are as a company, they're human centric. I am very human centric and I really embrace the human centric way of where, how we start doing our products, but also the, in, in the way we, we, we design them. So I'm very, very impressed by this company. Uh, they are very, very nice. They are very humble and they are 100% core people who wants and can and knows how to make really good products. Uh, so, so that was very, very easy for me. And, and again, I'm, I'm super, super happy for this opportunity to represent this company here in, in California. Very exciting future indeed. We'll keep our eyes on GAC. Here's a very introspective question for you, Pontus. If you woke up tomorrow morning and you were a car parked in a garage, what would you be? Yeah, I think I'm, <laughs> I think I'm a Bentley Super Sports. Oh, nice. <laughs> I'm, I'm a little bit more heavy set nowadays than I was when I was young and slim. So I have to probably be a, a little bit of a voluptuous car. But my brain and my energy is uh, several hundreds of horsepowers. And I'm nice. super quick. So <laughs> a little bit bulky on the visuals. But, you know, I am a, I'm a true car inside. Yeah, you can get up and go. Very nicely done. I like it. Worked perfect. Well, Pontus, up next is the last lap before we put the pedal to the metal. Let's say thank you to today's Cars Yeah sponsors. Hey, Cars Yeah, I'm a huge fan of Covercraft. I've protected my vehicles with their products for decades. Want to keep your vehicle's interior looking new? It's easy with Covercraft seat covers. They'll protect your seats from the daily abuse of pets, children, weekend adventures, and even those everyday spills. It's a fast, easy, and inexpensive way to keep your vehicle looking new. All Covercraft seat covers are easy-on, easy-off design that are machine washable. You can choose from many fabric options, colors, and accessories, all designed and carefully sewn for your special vehicles. Their seat gloves are semi-custom fit for cars and trucks, and their seat savers, a favorite of mine, are custom-tailored to fit your seats like a glove. Work truck seat covers are tough, durable, denim-weight fabric. It's like putting a pair of rugged jeans on your truck's seats. Want to stay warm? Covercraft also offers seat heaters. Covercraft is the right choice. Learn more today at Covercraft.com and tell them Mark at Cars yeah sent you. That's Covercraft.com. What's every automotive enthusiast dream? To design and build that perfect garage. My friends at Metron Garage are a group of creative talents who've combined their passion for cars with their careers in architecture. Their service includes unique garage design and state-of-the-art fabrication. They will create the coolest custom garage for you and your vehicles. Metron Garage's system features fully engineered commercial-grade material and structural framing that's stronger than traditional construction. Their designs are pre-engineered to meet your building codes for fast, bolt-together construction. With over 25 years of experience, you'll see a 3D rendering to visualize your custom garage and the final structure will fulfill all your storage needs. Contact Metron Garage today and begin realizing your dream garage. Go to metrongarage.com. That's metrongarage.com. Garage is built for discerning enthusiasts. Where it's not just a garage, it's where your dream garage comes true. All right, Pontus, we are back. We're entering the last lap. I'm going to fire off a series of questions and ask you to give our listeners some very quick Blips of that Bentley throttle. How wonderful those cars sound. So here we go. What's the best automotive advice you've ever received? I think be nice. You know, be nice in, in the working atmosphere. Uh, be, wor- be nice in your collaboration with fellow colleagues and, you know, cross the departments. We spoke initially, you and me, and you told me the interesting thing that you married an engineer and, you know, she called the designers the rubber ruler. Rubber rulers, yes. The thing <laughs> is that a lot of people think that engineering is the limitation for getting your design through. It's quite the opposite. It's the contrary. So we said about the, the, the limitations of budget, but what is feasible to do? People say, oh. I do a wonderful concept car, but then I come to a production car and you can see people give up. It's not true at all. The production cars, if you have the stamina to really push for it, they are by 
complete the sheer nature of actually doing something that works and is functional is actually looking much better than if it's a you know undisturbed wet dream so to say so be nice and also that is the same thing behind the steering wheel i've been <laughs> driving in many cars and and you know in many different countries and cultures and people drive different you know everywhere and and the thing is that i think that it's mma sometimes you know and and just expecting the worst and i also got my my fair share of road rage and then i go but why do i even bother about this because you know like the guy that you were maybe screaming at he will turn out the next week and be your new neighbor it always yeah. comes back and that's yeah. like in profession life you have done something which is not fair or, or injustice i mean you will pay back it this is like you know that butterfly effect or whatever and i think just be nice doing the cars working and also behind the steering wheel very nice just be nice for goodness sake if only everybody would act that way yeah Could you share one of your uh, personal habits you believe has contributed to your many successes over the years persistence Persi- and, and you know that doesn't that that goes for everyone you can never give up you can't be unreasonable and 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 you have to accept compromise but compromise doesn't mean a loss it just means another way how to handle the challenge but if you're persistent and you don't give up it's that like you know you will reach the the tree tops i mean you aim for the stars but you will get there if you don't do that no it won't work absolutely nice how about a resource there are tremendous resources for us these days is internet thing that we get to access all the time. Is there a resource you'd like to share? Yeah, I'm, you know, I'm repeating myself. It's the people around me. I know that I can have like a, a, a rough idea. And as soon as you start to interact with your colleagues and you get that creative hype, I mean, this is our drugs, you know, it's just the adrenaline we get when we start to do like uh, dip our finger into it and all this energy comes and we want to create. and. I mean, I don't know if a lot of people understand how much of a, of a, of a rush it is when you you basically start with a white paper. You come into a void, and there's absolutely a white room. And then, depending if it's a concept car or it's a product or it's a it's a production car, a few years later, it is actually there and it's materialized. And you know, I won't say that any one of us are you know godlike or whatever, because that's not what I'm saying. But we do create things that do work in collaboration with many more people. And we put these things on this planet and hopefully it work out good. It's sustainable. It makes people happy. It makes it work. It's safe, you know, whatever. But it's, it's an amazing feeling to create something. It's truly. It, it is. Absolutely. Now, if I could arrange for you to have a drink with anyone in the automotive industry, living or deceased, who would that be? Oh, I have so many heroes. I, I think that. Nuccio Bertone, maybe. Oh, um, yes. Who was not a designer by his profession, but he was still the design director and he was a great director and conductor. So he had like a lot of egos and a lot of stars and young people coming up. And he managed to have this creative output from, from Bertone, which was absolutely breathtaking at this time. That's a craft. That's an art. That's impressive. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Great way to describe him as an orchestra leader. Fantastic. Now, about a book, is there a book you've read you think our listeners should read that they would enjoy? Um, I read about one book a week. Uh, I love reading. I love uh, watching films. I learn so much about it because it's storytelling. And in the end of it, every car that you make has to have a content. And just by working very much cinematic or or connecting with people and and see it from different viewpoints you can learn so much so any book which has a subject which is interesting or challenging what you believe would be good stick with what you're passionate about sounds like the answer to that one or well, listeners I'll remind you you can find all these great resources Pontus has shared on his Cars yeah show notes page just go to carsyeah.com type in Pontus he's the only Pontus so you will find it very easily. But if you want to look up his last name, I'm going to have you say your, your last name because you say it so much nicer than me. I don't know. I say it with a Scandinavian accent, probably Fonteus. 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 Yeah. Beautiful. 
F-O-N-T-A-E-U-S. Beautiful Latin root to that name. Fantastic. All right, Pontius, we are up to the checkered flag. And this last question can be a bit of a doozy. Today is your lucky day because I'm going to buy you any cool collector car, vintage car, whatever it is. I'm going to park it in your garage there in beautiful Southern California. Perfect place to be driving this car. But there's a couple rules to this. One is you can't sell it to buy a bunch of other cars with. So don't just base it on price. The other is you have to drive it. No garage queens here. I want you out there going up the coast highway, enjoying that with your family. And it's the only cool collector car you can have in your garage. So what's it going to be? So this was an easy, easy question for me. I think that, and since my my kids are almost uh, old enough to uh, get out of the house, I'm only looking for two seats, right? Okay. So. I would say I have two cars. I have two cars, actually. So I will say the Lamborghini Countach LP 5000 Quattro Alvolo is, I think it's 1985. Why I would pick that is it's just been my dream car. It has no compromise. I don't know how good it would be on the road, though, which made me think about now when you said about it, a second car. But this car has been on my wall and most of the teenagers from you know my time when I was young, because it's no compromise. And you have to start with no compromise when you start a project, because it will be watered down. There's so many things happening along the road until you have something which is finished. So you have to be ruthless and just no compromise in the beginning. <laughs> the, actually, okay. the other car that I really like, and this may be a surprise, but it's an American car. And it's the Vector W2 or W8. Oh, okay. If you look at it now, that car, it looks very modern. You put it next to a lot of these um, supercars from that time. It has actually very, it's coming from the aeronautic aerospace industry. We can speak about America maybe not being a high-tech country because people don't, oh, yeah, you know. But if you want to have a jet plane, you go to America. And you want to have a spaceship, you go to America. And what I like with that car is it actually took the inspiration from that in a more fundamental and pragmatic way by how you construct it. And not as we did in the end of the 50s and in the beginning of the 60s, where it was a pure styling influence from all the wings and Thunderbirds and whatever. So, you know, like the technology, you know, aviation uh, fuses or whatever is in that car. I, I think it's pretty cool, that car from that time. I remember it when, when I was young and, you know, when you're coming up a little bit older, you start to like the things that you were exposed to when you were little younger. So Absolutely. Yeah. Wow. Very, two very unique cars, uh, spectacular cars, of course. But, you know, today I can only buy you one. So if today, if you had to narrow it down between the Lamborghini Countach or the Vector which would it be? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm an, I'm still a little bit Italian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very nice choice, my friend. It never, it will never go down in value that car. Yeah, they're quite spectacular. I've got uh, a good friend up here in the Pacific Northwest that has one, and I got to follow him to a car event one time. Got to ride the car as well, and uh, they are quite spectacular cars. Very, very cool cars. No wing, though. I mean, you know, I speak with a lot of people and go, yeah, sometimes I like it with a wing, and sometimes not. I, I I would have no rear wing. It's more beautiful without it. Well, I even like the old Periscopo, the original design, yeah, just very clean. I mean, they've got one there at the Lamborghini Museum there at the factory that is spectacular. Very, very uh, nice super, car. It's super, super pure, that car. Yeah, it is. Pontius, you've taken me on an incredible ride today. I knew you would. I've enjoyed getting to know you better. Thank you for sharing your journey with the Car Show listeners. Could you offer us one little parting piece of wisdom or guidance before you rip off down the coast highway in that Lamborghini Countach? So first of all, thank you for having me and, and you know, thank you for, for your kind interest. Uh, in You're welcome. The, and also I here speak for my team and for GIC. And, you know, um, keep, yes, please keep tuned. I think that GIC will be a, a, a very important and interesting car company. We will do things a little bit different. So I'm, I'm very excited. So, you know, we have to, to walk that talk and, and see in a few years, but just for nice. people like it's, it's, it's truly a, a, a cool company and I work for most of them. So, you know, the thing is follow your dreams, just follow your dreams 
and stay true to it. And it's, uh, I mean, I had a dream to come to America and it's it's hard. It's not like for Americans, maybe go and work in Germany because we have a lot of visa issues and, and you have to show that you qualify. But I think that you can do everything you want if you really, you know, keep to it and, and you persist and you work hard for it. And sometimes you work hard for something and you don't see a result. But it's what I said before, two, three years later, you see, wow, that's the echo of what you did, you know? I like it. The, the globe is, is not so big. And if you're not a creative person, it still kind of stay true to yourself. So we are designers, we are a little bit anarchist. We usually identify ourselves that we are the one who goes left when other people go right. So we do things opposites, right? It's just, we are just no revolution. No, we don't do it like that. Let's do it another way. And humans, we are so affected by what other people think around us. So if you like cars and you like a certain car and it's maybe quirky and it's not the most popular cars uh, or car among your friends, don't give a toss about that. You get the car you want to have and, you know, stay true to that because, you know, it's you have to live with it and you are the one who should be happy. You satisfy with yourself. we getting the car that you are in love with and just stick to that. Nicely said. What's the best way for our listeners to follow along with what GAC is going to be doing today and in the future? We will try to communicate as um, uh, much as we can here uh, the coming time. So we will probably, uh, you know, create some insights. Instagram or, or we have maybe have a Twitter account and, and we will see how we make our presence known here in America and hopefully by presenting very interesting products here. We have our show, which is uh, Detroit now, which we have been present a couple of times. And, um, you know, there's hopefully something cool coming out there and in the following years. So absolutely. Is there a website people can go to to learn something about JC? It's not an uh, American website at this moment. So we will, we will uh, do uh, something like that. So um, right now it's, it's, it's the Chinese one or national one. And it's actually hard to, to get information, and, and, but we will change that. Okay. You let me know, and I'll let our listeners know once that is up so we can keep an eye on it. Pontus, thank you for being so generous today with your time and expertise and for sharing a wonderful story with me today. Until you and I talk again, I'll see you down the road. Thank you. You take care of your cars, but who takes care of your investments? Tune-ups aren't just for engines. Updating your financial plan is important, too. Your GPS may take you from A to B, but it won't help you on the road to financial freedom. For that, you need a good co-pilot and a very trusted advisor. Chris Kimball, CFP, is just the man for the job. He'll guide you down that road without driving you crazy. For over 25 years, Chris has helped people just like you and me with their financial planning and investments. With a master's degree in financial services, he is eminently qualified, and he's a car guy too. Learn more at chrisvkimball.com or call 866-ON-A-PLAN. Securities through Money Concepts Capital Corp. Member FINRA SIPIC. CK Financial Services is not affiliated with Money Concepts Capital Corp. Thank you so much for joining us on today's ride here at Cars Yeah. Drive on over to CarsYeah.com to find show notes and inspiring automotive fun. Download your free copy of Filler Up, a fun book filled with gorgeous photographs of fuel filler fun, including quotes from more inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Download your copy today, and we'll see you next time on Cars Yeah!